I got Rob's mic. Uh, Mike's got Rob's mic. Mike's got Rob's mic. Rob, I got your mic. <laughs> Mike's got a mic. That was terrifying. Hi, everybody. Are you ready? What are they ready for? I don't know. It. Uh, you gonna break the news to him, Rich? The next person on stage is... It's gonna be upsetting to everybody, but I guess there's no time like the present. Yeah. This is weird. I don't like doing this. I don't like being this guy. I think sometimes uh, the people who run the show, when there's this kind of news, they should come out and do this because it's really their responsibility to be sure you know this. But they put it upon me to tell you, and I'm very, very, very sorry to say this, but our next guest is Misha Collins. <laughs> That late intro by Misha Collins was completely unmerited. He was four feet away from literally the curtain. He was right backstage. He literally was right. If you go Billy backwards, that's where Misha was. And you just take your own sweet time. Well, after the whole, I regret to inform you. <laughs> <laughs> I contemplated not coming out at all. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, did I get you? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. It's been nice not having you at shows. <laughs> <laughs> You're not the first person to tell me that. <laughs> It's been a stream of it. It was a funny classic spate, too. You say it, you drop that bomb, and then you leave, and we're out here naked singing a song with no Misha. Uh, good times. Good times. Good friends, good times. How's your weekend going? Have you been gambling a lot? I got in last night, so no, I haven't done anything but but this, but with you lovely people. Well, that's a bit of a gamble, isn't it? It's, I'm yeah. gambling my future. Yeah. In the, in I don't this. gamble anymore because I lose. Do you? I don't win. No. Yeah. That's, uh, that's weird. Most people, when they come to Vegas, they make a lot of money. Do they? Yeah. We're in Vegas. <laughs> yeah. Norton, you're here a lot. You, you usually... You, yeah. Norton knows what he's doing, though. Yeah, like he, knows like to, do. he knows how to play poker. I don't know how to play poker. Yeah, that's part of my problem. Um, you, count, you count cards. You're, you cheat, and you game the system. And anyone here who works in a casino will remember this Steven thing. Norton. <laughs> it's a capital N. You've got a team of people that you work with. Got it. Right. So, what, did you, have you been here for a couple of days? Have you been in a game? No, place? no, no. I just got here last night. Oh. Yeah, I was in Atlanta, which ah. is a place that I've been working at lately. He's doing well, a, a show. I'm doing a show. Yeah. Oh, congratulations! Yeah, I didn't know you were an actor. It's called. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, not really, but I do get gigs from time to time. It's funny. I, I've seen you on TV a lot, and I still didn't know you were an actor. I'm kidding, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Meet you, Con. Bye guys. Love you. Hi. Hi. Nice to see you all. Where are the bright lights? What? Oh, thanks. thanks. Um, what do you all want to talk about? You. My new show. It's going so great. I love it. Um. I, I hope we get to do lots more of it. Uh, we're, uh, we, we're, we're filming episode 11, and we will do 13 this season, so we're getting close to the end. Um, and my, my character's uh, quite, uh, quite a mess. <laughs> Which is nice, it's sort of like getting to play myself. What? We can't hear you. Uh, you can't hear me? That's what they're saying. Can you hear me now? Okay. Thank you for fixing that. Um, do you want to ask a question? Great. Hi. Hi. So, I'm not very prepared. Um, Great. Did... Would you like us to come back to you? No. Um, do you want help preparing? No, I, I know what I'm going to ask. Oh, you um, do? You were just I, stalling. Yeah. Okay. Collecting myself. Yeah. Uh, Castiel and Harvey Dent are on a case. How do they solve it? 
Uh, well, I think probably uh, Castiel um, tries to figure out who the victim is and tries to help them. Um, in this scenario, it's a, it's a helpless family uh, in a farmhouse in rural South Dakota. And, um, and Harvey Dent is riding shotgun, and when they get there, Castiel vanquishes the demons using his powers. Uh, he makes them uh, demon out, as the old expression is. And then Harvey Dent uh, shoots the family. Hi. Wow. <laughs> Hello. I also was unprepared, so I asked my friends for a question. Oh, great. Um, after your videos... It's good week, to be able to outsource. Like yeah, that. exactly. Delegate. Um, this week, with your van getting hit by the tree and running through the mudslide, we're just wondering if you value your life at all. <laughs> um, huh, that's an interesting question. One that I should probably reflect on. I have to say, I think I'm a bit of a danger enthusiast. I think I get a rush from being, like, I knew that there was flooding happening. I knew that the road was closed because of mudslides. I saw the police there. I went through the trees to get around them. <laughs> and then I ran on, hoping that I would see a house floating down the river or something like that, because that's just what's wrong with me. Um, so, I think that, that might be a, might be something to look at in myself. I remember my brother went through this phase when he was uh, like 20, where he, he, thought, <laughs> he thought that he was a supernatural being, and he thought that he was immortal, and <clears throat> so he would do things like he would stand on the edge of the Grand Canyon and he would see like a little craggy uh, outcropping 10 feet down and he'd go like eh, I'll jump and like jump down and make everyone scream um, and was like he would climb up into the top of the tallest tree he could find in the woods and then from the top of the tree leap to an adjacent tree. No joke. But I actually do think some of that's genetic. <laughs> so I do find myself doing things and thinking, okay, wait a minute, you have two children. Misha, don't, don't. Oh, just a little, says the other voice in my head. And that little voice wins a lot of the time. Uh, it was, I was sitting in my house. Uh, it's been raining a lot in Southern California, and I was sitting in my house, and... I was in uh, the corner of the house where the, it's right next to the driveway. So my van was like, I don't know, 10 feet from the house right there. And this giant tree, it's like a 100 foot tall tree, uh, fell on my van and the living room shook. Like it was like a thunderous explosion. And if it had been a few degrees, like 10 degrees, rotated clockwise, it would, I, I might not be here. It was, it was very exciting. <laughs> so when I went out to inspect my van, I was actually quite enthusiastic because I hadn't died, and that was exciting. <laughs> Hi. 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 Hello. Um, so over 15 seasons, there's over 20 hours of music in Supernatural. And I was wondering if there was ever a song or a band that you wish could have made it in the show but didn't. Were you, did you watch 15 seasons of Supernatural with a stopwatch? <laughs> I put every song that's on Supernatural on a playlist. What? That's impressive. That's amazing. How long did that take? Certainly more than 20 hours. I mean, I enjoyed watching and being like, okay, what's this song, what's this song? And then once I figured it out, I was like... Hey. Were you like using Shazam to figure out what songs were? I knew some of them already, but yes, I did need to Shazam some of them. Ah, oh, that's such a great tool. That's exactly what Shazam was invented for, right? For this purpose, exactly. Um, what was your question? <laughs> 
Was there a song or a band that you wish could have made it on the show but never got in? Well, I wish that um, the you, you know the final scene um, of the first draft of the last episode um, had the band Kansas on stage in the Aww. Roadhouse. Um, so so Dean's heaven was in a roadhouse. Sam comes in to, to find him in the roadhouse and on stage in the roadhouse, Kansas is playing Carry On by Wayward Son. Right. Oh. And <clears throat> I, I, I'm sure a lot of you know this already, but you for sure know this, but Kansas had already been booked um, and they were planning to come. They like blocked it out on their calendar and they were planning to come, but COVID made it so that it was impossible for them to travel to Canada. And so the script had to be rewritten. But I would have liked to have seen that and yes. to have had that finale. We actually did have Kansas on stage at San Diego Comic-Con for our Hall H panel one year. And that was so cool. There were a few moments um, over the course of Supernatural that were just kind of pinch me amazing moments. That was one of them. And then being in the theater where they do the, where they host the Oscars, uh, watching uh, Scooby Natural on the screen yes. was also one of those moments. Like, That's what so the fuck? How did you get here? <laughs> yes. How is this happening? That was amazing. Um, the, but yeah, anyway, there you go. That's a quasi answer. <laughs> Bye. Hi. Hi, Misha. I also have a music related question. Fabulous. So I'm a big baseball fan, and in the MLB, each player gets to choose a song that plays while they walk up to bat, and I was wondering what your walk up song would be. Wow. Do, well, uh, it, they, do they do that? No, she made it up. You know, I, it's funny, I, I guess I, I don't watch a lot of baseball. Um, and this is interesting because I, my, my son was in Little League last year. And they had this thing where you could pay in Little League. If you pay extra, you get a walk-up song to the, to the, when you go up to bat. But you had to pay. And I was like, F that. I'm gonna pay for, the, for a stupid song. And then all the other kids got like these great songs as they walked up to bat. And poor Westy was like, and eh, now West Collins. <laughs> and like, to just, you know, terrible, deafening silence. With the dad going like, yeah, buddy! <laughs> yeah! Um, I don't know. Do you have a recommendation for me? No? No, just whatever song you like. Okay, thank you. Thank you for giving me a walk. Thank you for that lifeline that you just threw me. Um, well, I think Castiel uh, sang the Greatest American Hero theme song, and I think that would be a pretty good one for, for me as well. Yeah, so I'll go with that. Believe it or not, walking on air. Yeah. Hi. Hello. I am curious about what your writing process is when you're writing poetry or anything else. Um, so if I'm writing a poem, typically <clears throat> I, I had access to the early versions of the software. Um, so I basically just plug in a couple of themes into the AR, the AI uh, <laughs> software, and then it spits out a poem. And if you do that enough times, then you have enough for a book. And it's actually quite efficient. I don't know why more people don't use this tool. <clears throat> I actually did um, start playing around with some of this AI technology recently and did that, like gave it a theme and points to hit in a poem. And I was like, well, that's better than a lot of people's poems, honestly. <laughs> it, it actually can crank, it, like churn out a coherent poem. It's kind of amazing. Um, I, I tend to, um, I, I have different, different processes that I engage in. One is um, I used to just set aside time every day where I'm like, this is it, sanctified, I'm gonna be writing in the morning. Um, and then <clears throat> at other points, it'll just be like, oh, I have an idea. A seed of a poem will come to me while I'm going for a run or, or going to sleep or something like that. And I'll just take down a few notes and then 
go write it in the morning or something like that. Uh, but a lot of times it comes when unbidden, like all of a sudden, it's like, oh, that's kind of a, an idea for a poem. Um, <clears throat> and sometimes, like it happened to me recently, I was just going to bed, and like this idea for a poem came into my head, and I wrote down a few notes, and then in the morning, I wrote the poem. And then I shared it with the person that it was about the next day, and uh, they didn't agree that it was a poem. <laughs> so sometimes, sometimes one is confused about the merits of one's writing. <laughs> and it's good to get that feedback. Yeah. Thank you. Are you a writer? I'm, I am I'm getting a master's in English, so most of my writing is all on the literary criticism end. Oh, wow, fancy. Well, that's intimidating. <laughs> Good luck with that. Hi. Hi, Misha. Um, I was curious, what do you think uh, Cass's favorite Led Zeppelin song would be from the mixtape? Um, uh, Stairway to Heaven? <laughs> Very safe answer, yes. A little on the nose. <laughs> I'm not a risk taker in this department. Hi. Um, I was curious what your first time in Vegas was like. Oh, I thought you were going to ask something else. Um, <laughs> funnily enough, my first time in Vegas was also my first time uh, in Nevada. Um, <laughs> I was... First time in Vegas. Oh, I remember. I was driving... Uh, I was driving across country to seek my fortune. I was 24 years old, and my girlfriend at the time, future wife and I, were driving across country in a uh, Toyota Corolla, and I know. <laughs> and badass, right? <laughs> and we drove through Vegas on our way out to LA. We we knew we had a place to stay for two weeks when we got to LA. I didn't have a reel, like, I had a, uh, a forged uh, resume for my acting credits, like I had made things up, uh, I put them on there. <laughs> didn't have an agent, I had one, f one phone number for one casting director, and that was it. It was like, this is gonna work out great. <laughs> And we stopped off for the night in Vegas, and we had no money. But I was like, I think it would be a good idea for me to probably make some more money while we're here. So I took the little bit of cash we had. I think, like, we figured that we could spare 40 bucks or something like that. And I invested that <laughs> at a blackjack table. And <clears throat> there was something weird about the deck or something. Uh, something went wrong that night and it didn't, the investment didn't pay off. <laughs> and then we stayed, we stayed at the shittiest hotel I think I've ever stayed in, really sleazy. And then the next day we drove on to um, LA and I was not being spoken to. <laughs> I had been so confident that it would work out. I was like, this is an easy game. You just gotta do it right. <laughs> so, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Hi. Hi. Um, so, all of the feels for Gish, and thank you for doing such an amazing job with that. Um, but thank you. No. That it's over. Was there ever someone like from the Supernatural cast that they've been involved in Gish? But was there ever someone you wish you could have grabbed to just make do either an item that was on the list or just make up an item for them just to just to mess with them? Well, I did mess with people over the years <laughs> yes, with Gish, and uh, so I think that like the, those dreams did come to fruition. <laughs> we messed with a lot of politicians. Um, yeah. We messed with writers. We, William Shatner. We we messed a lot with William Shatner. We we messed with the NASA and the and the, and the military. Um, you know these small players. We messed we messed with um, uh, uh, Jeff Bezos. Oh, that's right. 
and he actually messed with us back. Like, it was kind of great. It was a really great tool for messing with people. We had, uh, one of the items one year was get, uh, get, you know, on Amazon, there's reviews of everything, but reviews of books. And so the item was just quite simply get Jeff Bezos to personally review your ebook. And he did! <laughs> he was like, his office was inundated with all these requests, and he was like, well, this is fun. I think we'll do it. Um, funny sidebar, I actually ended up having a conversation. I met a lot of really great people through Gish over the years, and, um, and some of them were like, for example, um, Dave Lavery, who is the director of, this is the world's best job title, the director of solar system exploration at NASA. And it was because we were messing with NASA that it had to go like up the chain of command for them to finally agree to mess back with us. Like they were like, we would like to play with these people, but it's actually a violation of federal law. So, <laughs> but finally, you know, um, when, when NASA named a mountain officially, like they tweeted, NASA officially tweeted, Gishwiz was, had, had been, uh, the, a, a mountain on Mars was officially named by NASA, yes. Gish. And when they tweeted that, uh, it had to go all the way up to the director of NASA. Like it, it, was, such, it was such a breach of the private public uh, partnership rules that the government is run by that it literally had to go to the top of NASA for them to do that. Um, but I, like, I consider Dave a dear friend. I have another dear friend um, who uh, had the job title at Amazon. He ended up being on a winning team one year. Um, he had the job title at Amazon of uh, uh, Prime Minister of Ideas. He was the 20th employee at Amazon. And his job was basically to just find the most interesting moonshot projects for Amazon to undertake and go explore them with it, all of the resources of Amazon behind him. And I ended up meeting with his, uh, his like, team at Amazon and talking about Gish. And I probably signed an NDA about this. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but this whole team was doing such a cool thing, which was they had this mandate to tackle the problem of loneliness. And they were like, we think we want to, like, do something like what you're doing with Gish. Like, let's keep talking about this, how we could tackle the problem of loneliness with something like this, which I thought, that's so cool. I mean, it's really cool that sometimes corporations are ruminating on things that are, that's really intended to solve some of the existential problems of the world. And of course, sometimes they're engaging in, you know, full on evil, but... <laughs> It's nice that there's a yin and a yang to it, you know? <laughs> Hi. Hi. So first, I love Judith Castiel. Looking forward to Thank Gotham you. Nights. But I have a question. Um, you've been posting about Gotham Nights and about the making of your mask. How long did it take for the mask to be made? And how long does it take to put on when you're filming? Well, the mask, the, the mask took... Um, about, I think they were working on the actual, from design inception to when it was finally finished was like four months. Um, but they were actually building the final version of the mask for about a month. It's, um, it's like a very soft, flexible material that sticks to your face with glue. Um, and there's a mold for the mask but every time it's applied, it comes in two pieces that cover, this is, I'm revealing too much. Oh well. Um, it covers like, not just my, half my face, but also half my head and down my neck. So it's really like, like all of this. And it comes in two pieces and it take, the, the, the last ap application took three hours Wow. Um, and then it takes like 25 minutes to get it off. So it's a it's commitment. You don't just like put the mask on just to try it on, you know? Um, but it looks great. I think it, <clears throat> I mean, other, it looks better than, it's better looking than any other uh, Two-Face that you've seen. I, I will say that. It's, nice. 
it, it's like, it looks very realistic. Um, it's group gross. Um, you know, it's like not the kind of thing that you would want to let someone that you would want to have sex with see, you know? Because that's, that's done at that point. It's pretty gross. Um, <clears throat> my daughter was flipping through my phone, never a great idea, and, uh, and she came to it and I, like, she swiped to the photo of my, my mask and I just like grabbed the phone. And she was like, what, what was that? And I was like, you can't see that. And then I described it to her and she said, yeah, no, I don't think I'll be able to sleep if I see that, thank you. <clears throat> She's so funny. <clears throat> um, we were talking about um, pronouns in the car the other day. This is not related. Um, but it's such, an it's such a cool thing watching these kids in school now um, because interacting with their friends, interacting with fr friends' parents who are gay, they have no consciousness that it's weird for their friend to have two moms. When I was a kid, that was like, oh my God, that's so crazy, you know? And then we would like all talk about it behind their backs, right? Now my kids are like, what, that's a thing? Like, it doesn't make any difference to them whatsoever. Nor does, like, they have trans friends. They have, they have you know, just this consciousness of things that um, was, comp like, we just made fun of each other by calling each other gay when I was their age. Like, kids were mean to each other, by, and then we would just be like, you're gay. And that was, like, the meanest thing you could say. They would never say that now, and it's so great. And we were talking about pronouns, and there's also like no, there's no charge to that for my kids. They're like, yeah, whatever, I have a friend who goes by they, and I was like, what are your pronouns, kids? I, they said, what's your pronoun, dad? And I said, I, I think I'm a he, and, and Wes said, yeah, I'm, I think that feels right for me too, I'm a he, and Mason, what about you? And she said, I think I'm a the. <laughs> Yes, you are, my dear. Yes. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Nisha. So, I know you do cameo videos. Um, one of my best friend's husbands proposed to her with one of your cameo videos, so thank you for that. <laughs> one of your best friend's husbands? Yes, yeah, so he had you How many husbands does she have? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's it's hard. Who um, So they live in Utah. What is that? No, we're here. We're local. Okay. okay. <laughs> so my question is, what is the strangest or most memorable cameo video you've ever done or been asked to do? Well, there have been some cameos that I've been asked to do that I didn't do. <laughs> I can report that. Um, some that were basically like pornography requests basically <laughs> um and as far as you know i did not fulfill those <laughs> as far as you know yeah great hi Misha. hi it's nice to actually finally meet you <laughs> nice to meet you as well i'm roxanne from tucson I you had a panel with Jensen a while back, and you were talking about getting ready for a sex scene. How did that go? Oh! I lost the thread there for a second. Uh, I was like, I don't remember doing a sex scene with Jensen. Um, I, 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 I would think I would remember that. Um... I mean, we didn't, we didn't call it a scene. It was just, um... The, um... Sex scenes went well. You know, it's a little, we I'll be honest with you, it's a little weird to have a sex scene. And, and I should also clarify that the sex scenes that I had were, it was most, it was, it was a making out 
and some getting into it, and then some post-coital, but we didn't do the full money, like, if you know what I mean. <laughs> but I have done that before, and it's strange. Uh, and I'm not talking, I, 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 obviously I've had sex, but I've... <laughs> Um, my kids are my biological children, um, but I, um, you, you have to pretend to be having sex in a sex scene, and it's considered not cool to actually have sex in a television sex scene, especially on the CW. Um, but <clears throat> there's a, there's like all these now layers of. Uh, sensitivity around it like you have a an intimacy coach on set for sex scenes and you have um, all of these sort of precautions and everybody make sure everybody's okay um, but back in the day it was just like you just go do your thing um, and I remember one of the first scenes that I did like that was on the show 24 Ooh, and nice, the so. girl who was riding on top of me in that scene <laughs> took off her robe, the, 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 the camera, they, they do uh, what's called, they do a closed set, which is like a sort of skeleton crew for intimate scenes, which means there's only like 30 people in the room <laughs> <clears throat> instead of the usual. And um, so it's very private. It's just her, me, and the entire sound department, camera department, and uh, the props department, and the wardrobe department. Props, ooh. And <laughs> hair and makeup, and that's it. <laughs> Aside from the director and the producer. <clears throat> and so she's on top of me, she takes off her robe, and she had these little, they do these, uh, mo they do what they call modesty coverings, which is basically like a sock for me. Obviously a very large sock. And, <laughs> and then, Ain't and then sock. like, a, a, basically like a, a flesh-toned pad like adhesive pad for the woman and pasties on the nipples as if like at this point I know what's under there <laughs> anyway on her pasties she had written hi Misha <laughs> it was quite delightful <laughs> there are moments when you're an actor on a set and you look up and you think, I'm getting paid right now. <laughs> How did I work this out? This is amazing. Um, but I digress. Um, great. <laughs> Hi. I don't know if my question can top that one. That was amazing. <laughs> I have a fun question, I think. Um, if you could create a drink for Harvey Dent and a separate drink for Castiel, what would that drink be? Hmm. Well, I think Harvey Dent... Mm. Harvey Dent probably will have something like whiskey-based, for sure, um, but something that can be sipped with a straw. Um, <laughs> because I think he's gonna have a hard time... Swallowing? I know he's gonna have a hard time <laughs> drinking from a glass. <laughs> Um, I also, as the actor who performs Harvey Dent, have a difficult time keeping liquid in my mouth. <laughs> I'm gonna have to put you in time out for that comment. She said that's what she said. Um, okay. But uh, I, 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 I have to keep uh, like a paper towel handy because I, <laughs> <laughs> I drool, I drool a lot, um, and it's just, it's it's pretty gross. Um, yeah, it's gonna be tricky. I hope not. It's funny. It's a funny thing because I'm really proud of the work that we're doing on the show. I think it's great. It's really tight. Like all of the storylines pay off. Um, you get invested. It's a slow burn. The show is a slow burn. So in the beginning, it's like, we're just setting it up. It's not pushing it too fast. But then as you get in to the season, it's like, oh shit, what's gonna happen next? Um, this guy's unraveling in my case. Um, and I really want people to see that. 
But then, you know, t toward the end of the season, when we get into this, this disfigured version of the character, um, I want people to see it, but again, I still want to be able to have sex. And I don't know how, how to work those two things together because it's so gross. I look so awful. Um, it's, uh, so yes, a drink with a straw. And um, for Castiel, um, a blueberry smoothie. Is that a euphemism? Hi. Okay. First, I want to apologize. I don't have a Thank mind blowing question. Thank you. Like the taco question. Okay. So, sorry. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. It was good. You had you had a good run. I did. You know. Um, so you recently posted a pic a video of that mask going on, which funnily enough led to Natalie saying you were walking spoiler, which led to the op. Um, right. 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 My question was um, for you when they actually put all of that on. What was that process like for you? Because it didn't look like they really left you room to breathe. I, uh, so the mask, I, for those of you who don't know, I, I posted a video online that was like them making a mold of my face to, in order to put the, build the appliances for the um, two-faced mask. And I, um, and they basically just like pour this, this silicon sludge that hardens over your whole head and then cover that with pla plaster bandages that then give it some structure. And it, uh, they go right over your nose and just leave tiny apertures, but there's not like they stick anything in there to protect it, to make sure something doesn't. I think that they figure, like, worst case scenario, you know, we can recast this role. <laughs> but it, it, it was interesting, it was remarkably suffocating. Like you can't see, your eyes are covered, your mouth is covered, you can't move, and it, the process is like an hour and a half. It's not quick, oh so, it, it, yeah, you have to, they're like, you kept checking, like, are you okay, are you okay? And I was like, mm, mm. They, they didn't know that I was saying no, but there's no way to communicate, so, yeah. Hi. Hi, my name's Shauna, it's nice Hi, to Shana. meet you, this is my first con, I'm very nervous. Welcome. <laughs> um, so my question is, is there anything Castiel did or said that had a major impact on the tra trajectory of the show that you wish you could change? That's a good question. Um, wow, that's a good question. Do you have an idea for that? I mean, do you have, I, hello Dean? That really changed things right there. It was this nice show about two brothers. And this creepy angel comes along with no social graces. Um, I don't know. That's a really good question. What did Cass do that he shouldn't have done? A lot. A lot. <laughs> God? Yeah, when he became God. That was not, that was not cool, right? Yeah, I mean, it was kind of cool, though. <laughs> it was nice to be God. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on that matter? Uh, one thing that comes to mind is, um, hold on, I lost my train of thought now. That's okay. We'll get there. So the way when everything goes down with Jack and Mary, the way that it was handled afterwards, um, maybe if he had some words of advice so that Sam and Dean could learn to forgive him um, instead of, you know, just kind of chasing after him and all that. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't totally know what you're talking about. What? <laughs> what, Jack Kick killed Mary? Sake. Yeah, that was bad. <laughs> Cool, thank you. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, looking forward to Gotham Nights. Good. Uh, haven't listened to second season of Bridgewater yet, but I will. Okay. Um, Thanks for the update. Is there any chance of bringing back road food? And if you do, please come back to Oklahoma. Okay. Great. Um, yes, that's what you I, said. There's, there, there's a little, like, room where we backstage in the bowels of this hotel um, there's a bathroom and on the door to the bathroom 
It's actually like a dressing room connected to a bathroom, but it's where, this is a little behind the scenes uh, insider information for you. It's where the cast of Supernatural go to excrete. And, <laughs> and, uh, and there's a sign on the door that says, reserved for Supernatural cast. And I open the door and there's a band in there, and it's not our band, it's some other band. And this was just like an hour ago. And I was like, hey guys, and they're like, hey man, how you doing? They were British, and they sounded like Mark Shepard. And I was like, yeah, that's really, that is British. Okay, there's a British woman in the front row who is correcting my accent. I know you're not really British. Um, and so the guy was like, wait a minute, I know you. Shut up. It's fine. That's what she said? No, I'm self-conscious. You, you cover your ears. I know you. You're, uh, <laughs> you did that like cooking travel show, didn't you? I love that show. And I was like, oh my God, that's so great to be recognized for road food and not supernatural. Um, and that's, that's happening every once in a while these days. And I just had a conversation with the producers yesterday on the, as I was getting on the plane coming here about like, oh, what do you think? We're gonna try to do another one? So we're gonna try to figure out how to do another season of it. It's, it's tough. Um, it's tough when I just, you know, we, I have another show going on. So I have to figure out how to do all of the things and make time for kids too, so that's, that's the challenge. But it was great, it was such a fun way to explore the country, you know? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Misha. My husband and I are expecting our first child in a couple of months. Oh my God. And I was wondering what is your best and worst piece of parenting advice? <laughs> okay. Well, I don't know if I have bad parenting advice. I just have advice of what not to do. Is that helpful? Um, so when, um, when West was born, that's my, my first child, similar situation to what you're gonna be in soon. Um, I thought, I watch all these helicopter parents who like suddenly changed their lives completely and now it's all about like kids and playgrounds and all this bullshit and Really, like, what's good for kids is just to be brought along on the adventure of life with the grown-ups and just be in the thick of everything, and they get to just soak that up. So we don't have to, like, tailor our lives to the kids. We just fold the kids into our lives, and it's going to be great. And so West was born, and we, uh, I was working on Supernatural, and then we had the, the Christmas winter break, and we decided we were going to go from Vancouver, where we were staying. West was, at that point, uh, like three months old, and not even three months old. And we were gonna go from Vancouver down to San Francisco and spend Christmas in San Francisco. And we decided, we have a two and a half month old. Let's make this fun and do a road trip. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> The first night we stopped in uh, like southern Washington and uh, some friends were having a party and friends friends were strippers and there's a photo that exists of West in swaddle on a bed with a naked woman standing on the bed as well. And I look at that and I'm like, oh my God, that happened? And then we kept driving, and West, it turns out, hates the car um, as a baby. Like, now he's fine, but when he was young, he hated being in a car, he hated being in a car seat, and he would cry constantly. By the time we got to the Oregon-California border, he had cried himself hoarse. So now his, like, two-and-a-half-month-year-old voice was just like a... Uh, uh, as he was crying, as we were driving, and we're like, oh, and the only thing that we could do, for whatever reason, there's this band called Peaches. <laughs> and for whatever reason, like, pe 
peaches seemed to soothe him, but peaches is like this really hard kind of grinding, uh, like the lyrics are, fuck the pain away. And so it's like blasting this peaches at this poor child. And, and, and really it was like, he, he stopped crying, but obviously in hindsight, I know what was happening is his tiny brain was like, how did I get born into this horrible family? He was just processing the shock and horror of it. And then we kept driving and we went to, uh, we, we got to like the outskirts of San Francisco and this friend texted and was like, hey man, there's a, there's a like Burning Man spin-off rave happening tonight, you wanna come? And I was like, yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> so I put West in the baby carrier and go and it's like midnight and this loud music and I knew enough about babies to know that you can't expose them to loud noises because they'll go permanently deaf. So I had my hands pressed over <laughs> his baby ears <laughs> and, and I like looked down at him I remember distinctly looking down at him and realizing like it's midnight and uh, I guess maybe this will fold the kids into your regular pre parent life isn't quite how this is going to work he looked at me I looked at him and it was like a seminal moment where I was like right going home <laughs> going to bed and changing my life completely. Um, so that's a little bit of advice, which is your life is about to change radically and don't resist it, just go with the flow. Um, another thing I will tell you, it took me too long to figure out just how precious childhood is. In the beginning, I was busy, I was working like 80 hours a week, I was tired, putting the kids to sleep was just like, Ugh, it's just another chore. It's just another thing I have to do. And I was resisting it. I remember I used to bounce Mason to sleep every night. And I would be counting. Like, I, count, I knew that if I counted slowly to 200, by the end of 200, she'd be asleep. And then I could put her down. And I would just sit there and count. Like, but it was like I was waiting for it to be over, right? And then at some point I realized, what the, what are you doing? this is going to be over, and then you're going to wish you could be putting your kid to sleep. And that was, that was a big and important discovery for me. Like, right, slow down and soak every second of this up because it's going to be gone. And I had that, like, just, just last year, <laughs> for reasons that I won't get into, uh, M Mason said she was nine, and she was like, Dad, can you wipe me? And that was something like, she was actually kind of late to the self-wipe, um, but I, I realized, like, I'll, I'll, in the process, was like, every part of being a parent is precious. Even, even wiping their butts is precious. <laughs> and when she, last year, basically, her hands were more or less covered in some disgusting things from the kitchen and she couldn't wipe herself. And she was like, Dad, can you wipe me? And I was like, oh, this is gonna be the last time I ever do this. <laughs> oh, you know? Um, there's so many lasts, so sort of treat every moment as if it might be. Thank you. Um, you just said, yes, thank you. All that is true and you're a wise man. <laughs> So, hi. Hi. Are you a, are you a father? Yes. She's yes. 22 now. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Holy smokes. Yeah, it went fast. And are you still wiping her? Sorry? <laughs> <laughs> I thought this was PG. No, no. Where did it say that? <laughs> if you could reboot a sci-fi series, what would it be? And why is it Serenity? <laughs> that is a good I, that is a good choice I have several that I would like to reboot though I loved Westworld I wish we got I wish we got more of Westworld um, I, there were a lot of shows that I loved uh, like Invasion and yeah. Heroes I loved I loved the first season of Heroes I would like to reboot the first season yeah. of Heroes um I would love to reboot uh, Greatest American Hero. And, 
That's not just because I referenced it earlier, but because when, and that's not really a sci-fi show, but there's a superhero in it, so I count it. And that show, when that would come on, when I was like six, it was like every fiber of my being got so excited. It was just so great. Um, there's, there are a lot of shows, but I think probably right at the top of the queue would be Supernatural. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Yeah, I think it could be really cool without the brothers. It would be... <laughs> Just you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Cass in solitary confinement. <laughs> For 12 seasons. No Crowley. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Um, I liked your TSA shorts, so if you could ever do a few more of those, and if you could have like a guest star on there to kind of punk out that way, um, who would it be and what would you do? Um, well, I, there, is a, there was another script, so I know what the story would be. For, there, I did these, like, um, I directed and co-wrote some, and actually acted in these uh, shorts. Uh, they're like little comic shorts about TSA pre-check, or TSA uh, checkpoints. Um, they're online, you can find them. Um, they're easy to find if you use Google. <laughs> they're short, it's, it's, not, it's a, not a big commitment, maybe five to seven minutes or something like that. So it's, I, I would request that you go check that out. Um, I go through uh, TSA checkpoints very frequently. I fly probably two to three times a week on average, and uh, often I will get, I think it has made the rounds with TSA officers, those videos. It might be part of orientation now, I'm not sure. <laughs> because I very frequently am like, they're like, hey man. I'm like, yeah, I know, Castiel. They're like, no man, I like your uh, TSA stuff. <laughs> or sometimes they're like, yeah, I saw your TSA videos. <laughs> so this one video is, uh, it's called Hive at Pat Town, I think. Um, it's one episode, and the idea is like this: this like Texas cowboy comes in. I tried to get Jared to do the role, but he refused. Um, <laughs> he didn't want me touching him like that. Apparently. Um, Again. So it's like this: this like Texas farm boy comes through, and he's like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa! I'm not taking <coughs> off my belt." And so then he has to get routed into a separate room for private pat down, and I am performing the private pat down, which gets very steamy and intimate and emotional. We talk about his family and, and it gets homoerotic and he goes in for the kiss. I think ultimately, I think Jared was afraid he wouldn't be able to control himself in that situation. <laughs> um, so anyway, we do that scene. It was very funny. By the way, the cinematographer now on Gotham Knights, by coincidence, 15 years on, was this, the cinematographer that I used for that short. I walked into, onto set and I was like, dude, what are you doing in Atlanta? Um, but he was also operating the camera and he was laughing so hard that he was ruining takes because the camera was shaking. <laughs> so I go into, I don't remember what, what city I was in because the TSA checkpoints all look the same, but I go into TSA checkpoint and um, I had to, I, I, I set off the alarm. And so they started doing an enhanced, like, pat down. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, we nailed it in our video. <laughs> like, the things this guy is doing is exactly verbatim what I did in that video. Like, he's running his hands through under my belt, like I did in the video. Um, he's like patting down my butt and then like saying I'm gonna I'm gonna pat your buttocks now like just like I did in the video and he's getting like way up in my business right up in my face like all of the stuff and then he was like he yelled all clear at the end of the pat down and then he looked at me and smiled and like, you fucker <laughs> You just 
was like, he did, he did a whole thing. And the whole time he had me thinking I was a genius. It was brilliant. I was like, oh my God, good on you. That was so good. You had me the whole time. I was like, I cannot believe this fucking guy is sticking his hands in my pants. They really do this shit. Anyway, I guess my answer is uh, Jared. I'd get Jared in the episode. Thank you. Hi, um, Hi there. My daughter is LJ, and she's very inspired by your character, Castiel. It's inspired her artwork, and it's made her get back in art, which is blessing to me. So if there was anything, any idea that you would have that you could have captured um, on acrylic or pencil, what would it be? Uh, I, that's a great question. I, I have a sentimental attachment to um, ginkgo trees. So a beautiful ginkgo tree with a sunset. How's that? Is that a good, is that a good assignment? I, we can work with that. Great. I look forward to seeing this work of art when it's materialized. Um, it's a lovely th thing seeing your kids uh, flourish and, and really start to master something, isn't it? She actually made it into the Gish book this year. Um, oh, that's awesome. So that's she, awesome. She, you really set her to the next level, so I'm very, very thankful. Well, that's so cool. I think, uh, I think this, like, this fandom has so much creativity in it. And that really was the inspiration for starting Gish in the first place. It was like seeing all the artwork that people were producing. I was like, wow, I could give them assignments. <laughs> this is great. Um, but the, the art that has been created over the years um, through Gish, but also just in the fandom in general, is like kind of breathtaking. It's so astonishing. There's so many great artists in this community. It's pretty, it's pretty intimidating. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Um, speaking of art, I just, uh, uh, Jared Jensen and myself and a few other uh, friends went to see the James Terrell uh, installation this morning at the Louis Vuitton store. If you can get in, it is absolutely amazing. It is the coolest installation I've seen in a long time. Has anyone seen it? It's been here for 10 years. And you go in by, like, with your, a group of five people privately for half an hour. They give you a half hour window. And it's this immersive light experience that you, have, you completely lose. You can't tell where a wall is. You, you're completely disoriented. It's super trippy and amazing. It's really, really cool. James Terrell. This is, this, James Terrell is one of like he's one of the best artists uh, living in America, and his installations are they cost twenty five million dollars. Like uh, there, he's a very successful artist, and we were going to this James Terrell installation, and this morning, Jared and Jensen were sitting down in the lobby waiting for me because I was late, and. Jensen was like, that guy looks, looks like James Terrell right there. And there's a guy like with a suitcase going by. And Jared's like, dude, dude, that is James Terrell. <laughs> and they looked at the phones and were like, oh my God, that's actually him? And it had nothing to do with this insulation. He just happened to be in town. No way. On, literally on our way to walk over to see the installation, they just happened to pa pass by. James Terrell. He's staying at your hotel. Apparently, he had a suitcase. <laughs> He's staying at the Holiday Inn on the freeway. It's the Ramada, Ramada Inn. <laughs> Wait a minute, he was there for the free buffet. That's right. <laughs> you're, you're in Barstow, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've heard that he loves to make your own pancake machine, and now it, it makes sense. I get it. That's so well. Did you go up to him and say something? I wasn't there, and they didn't say something, which I... I uh, well, it didn't happen, but hey, it's a great story. <laughs> and my phone broke and I took no photos, but anyway. <laughs> we also sat uh, next to uh, Chris Angel, 
at, at a restaurant last night. He was at the next table over. Or did you? And, right. And, and, huh? Cliff, and Cliff looks at Jared and he's like, Jared, it's not worth it. Because he knew that Jared is going to get up and do something and like Chris's security guys are going to be like, get the, get the hell away. Um, so. Or would they? Or would they? But it, it occurred to me, like, he, he's got to know who you are, who we are, right? Like, we're a big deal. And plus, there was an episode of Supernatural that was titled Chris Angel is a Douchebag. Yeah. So I wanted to be like, hey, man, it's such an honor. We, we actually are like kind of stars of a show, and we, we name an episode. And it was like, Chris Angel is a Douchebag. Um, Did you say anything? No. Uh. Wow, that's wild. His security would have made you disappear. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good though. That's, those are both solid stories. Thank you. I haven't seen anybody. I saw Richard in the lobby. Or right? did you? <laughs> <laughs> I, get, I, I, did, I did have this happen. So I was just directing, I'm currently directing the episode of Walker, and the writer of the episode said, man, a guy named David James, great writer, young, young fellow, it's his second episode, or his third episode on the show, writing. He's been there the whole time, though. And he said, man, I've had two celebrity moments in my life. He's like, halfway through the shoot, he goes, I just got to tell you, I'm a big Supernatural fan. Big Supernatural fan. I'm like, well, that's really cool. That's awesome. This would be a great gig for you, because Jared was on that show, in case you weren't aware. Um, and he's like, I've had two amazing celebrity moments in my life that just uh, stick with me. And one was, somebody I don't care about, somebody famous, I don't know. And he goes, but the other one is, like, I was at LAX, and I was waiting for my luggage, and I turned, looked up, and I realized, I'm standing next to Rob Benedict. <laughs> and Ruth Connell's next to Rob Benedict. And I'm like, hey. this is the greatest, this is so cool, I couldn't this believe I was standing next to Rob Benedict. And I'm like, well, was this a long time ago? Yeah. And he's like, no, it was last year. I'm like... While you're a writer on Jared Padalecki's like you show, you know, you could have just turned to Rob and said, yeah, well, Hi, I'm a writer on Walker, I'm a big fan yeah, of your work, we're kind of right. peers, and Rob would have said, Please hire me. <laughs> like, <laughs> Write me a roll. Quit yeah. <laughs> with the chit chat, Junior, and start typing. <laughs> anyway, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> enough of these celebrity sightings. That right there, that man, that guy right there. A real celebrity. That's Misha Collins. Understands this is happening now. Go away. <laughs> I don't know why. Rob and I are we're not fighting. We're getting along well, relatively. Lies, Richard. We, lies. Well, we, I mean, clearly the lies because something something has happened. A wedge has come between us, and now they've split us up. Who's next? I don't know. Wait, I do know. We do, we actually didn't talk. Okay, what are we going to play? What do you do? You have a plan for this moment? You know. Anybody want to tell me? Can well, I? He's done solo panels before. Yeah, but I'm not. I'm out here to do. Like, what do you I? You just introduce him, Rich. Don't yeah, you worry. Right. You got this, Rich. Okay, all right. We're professionals, Rich. Yeah, Rich. Stephen, I'm trying to be serious. <laughs> Don't say asinine things. Or I'm trying to be serious. Hold on. Shh. 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 There's a Misha Collins. Wow, he's a celebrity sighting. Right he looks there. just like the real one. As he walks through the crowd. Look at him. That dude should enter the Castillo Lookalike contest. He would be in the top four. So he gives a hug, and so then he proceeds to go sign oh, various, <laughs> various <laughs> posters. Oh my god, he's going to sign off. Yeah. 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 Oh, oh my god, god. Oh, there he goes. Oh, there. Oh, the signature. Oh, god. God. Did you see the that stroke scene. on that? Oh, yeah, did I see the stroke on that? Behold! Hashtag stroke on that. Behold the moment that Misha signs. And that's with his right hand, people. Notice the subtleties of his signature. Good lord. That was amazing. It was something else. I would hate to follow that. Ladies and gentlemen, Rob Benedict! That's my mom! Rob, I, 
I'm going to give you the first question. Okay. When was the last time we've both been at a con yet divided up to do our own panels? Never. It's been a long time. I, I, I honestly, I can't ever remember that happening. Not in these here United States, but it's happening now, ladies and gentlemen. Rob Bennett. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. And he'll have his own panel later. Uh, we're not. We're not fighting. We're not fighting at all. And not any more than usual. Uh, anyway, but it's nice to be with you alone. And the lights are so bright, I can't see everybody going for the exit. So that's nice. So it feels like everyone stayed after Misha's panel. Um, that's, a, that's a good feeling. Uh, anyway, nice to see you all. Nice to be here. Uh, let's start with some questions. Yes. Hi, Rob. Hi. How are you? Good, how are you? I'm great, thanks. This, is, this has been a great weekend. Oh, great. I've been here since Wednesday. Good Eight. for you. Yeah, right? Uh, I don't even know what day it is anymore. I am jealous. <laughs> Just wanted to see if you can uh, talk a little bit about the new album and any inspiration on that. Yeah, it was cool. The, the new Loud and Sweet album uh, was the, it was supposed to be like sort of, we put out an album a year before that, uh, album Foolish, and there was, we had, we had recorded more songs at that, in that session, and so it was going to be sort of a, a follow-up, like, like Foolish's brother, and then we realized, then we got together and we started, we had all these songs that had sort of built up over uh, lockdown, and so we started writing all these other songs together in a room, and we're like, oh, this is its own album. This is its whole new thing. And um, so there's an energy to this album that we haven't had in a while. It was the energy, the excitement of being back together in the room. Uh, the Able to Use Foolish was basically done in our own four different places. Uh, but this was all of us together in a room uh, with songs kind of written by all of us through, through lockdown. Um, so yeah, I just, I love the energy of the album. I'm super excited about every one of the songs and uh, um, everybody, you know, Norton wrote a couple, and Billy wrote several, and um, it's, it was very collaborative, and uh, yeah, it's just, I'm super excited about it. It's like back to sort of what we do best, which is just rock, fun rock music, you know? So yeah, and uh, we call it Feelings and Such, which is a line in one of the songs that I wrote, and, uh, and, it's, uh, and it really has a lot of feelings in it. A lot of feelings there, as always. Um, I was thinking, the other day, like, I used to write songs and kind of create characters that they're about, you know, there's, there are different characters in my songs that, you know, um, like, like the uh, Silver Spoon's about a character, you know, that's not me, you know, um, and uh, Suit and Tie's about some dude that I made up in my head. But lately, this album's have been really personal to me, and this one is no different. This is very personal, there aren't very many characters. Um, it's just me, you know, all the lyrics that I, uh, that I write, the lyrics for the band, and, and they're very emotional for me. So it's, you know, it's a great way to sort of get your emotions out through that, that kind of live feeling music. So, and we'll play a, a bunch of them tonight. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Hi. Literally, I love you and Supernatural like so much, and I've been waiting to like go be here and talk to you since I was like five. That's amazing! <laughs> wow, how old are you now? Ten. Okay, that's cool. So five years. Half as long. I was it's so nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. But I wanted to know what it was like, like filming on Supernatural, and also being like such a big, but more like on the villain side of a character. It was pretty wild, you know, because. Um, my character had so many changes. At first, you know, I was like the prophet, and uh, and then and then I was God, uh, and I was kind of more of a likable God, and then I was a not very likable God at the end. So it was a, it was a lot, you know, it was, it was a lot of changes that I had to sort of add on to the pre-existing character. Um, but it, it's always fun to play the bad guy. I play, I've played the bad guy on a lot of different shows lately. And that's, you know, it's nothing like what I'm like, and that's why it's kind of fun to do. Um, and you do get a lot of really good lines. Um, so that was fun, even though I was hated by everybody, it was fun to do that at the end. Um, but it was, it was crazy, it was a wild journey. I'm glad I got to be on a lot of the show and be with it all the way through the end. So, thank you so much. Thank you, nice to meet you. 
Yeah, I was saying that to somebody earlier uh, in a meet and greet that, uh, yeah, it was just, it, Chuck went through so many different pieces, so many different changes to his character, and it was a challenge. I really tried to keep the through line of the, like, the same guy uh, from the beginning, but uh, yeah, and that's what I tried to do even when he became unlikable, and uh, yeah, I just tried, tried to embrace it. That's all you can do. Hi. Hi, Rob Benedict. Hello. Um, as somebody who is super talented in like multiple things, do you consider yourself a singer who acts or an actor who sings? Wow, well first of all, thank you for saying that's a nice thing to say. Um, um, I, I, you know, I, I used to think different on it than I do now because it used to be like, I'm an actor and singing's like an extracurricular activity. And now, they're both part of who I am as an artist. Um, I still give more, um, the acting jobs take precedence. Um, and, and that's really, I think, I still think of acting more as like my job, what I do. Um, it truly is, you know, a passion of mine. And it's also what, what I went to school for. And, um, and so I, I still have the mindset that like that's, yeah, I, I, I have to keep acting. You know, and, and it, it brings me such joy, and uh, I, I just really enjoy every job that I have. Now, that's not, I never, I mean, uh, the music is, you know, I, I, I couldn't live without music, so I couldn't choose one over the other. But I guess I still think of myself as an actor who has a band. But the band is uh, it's something I'm like super proud of that has. Um, I think the band itself has elevated itself, and I'm so excited that people, more people know about my band. You know, we've been together for 25 years, and uh, there were, you know, back in the day, it was, we were playing to like three or four people, and I'm talking about like in the 90s, you know, when we were first together. So we've come a long way, and that's exciting. Um, so proud of it. Um, so I guess, you know, I, but I don't think of it anymore as an extracurricular. It's part of who I am, part of what I do. I guess just acting is like, uh, it's just, it's something, it's my job that I, you know, I, I, I need to keep, to keep feeling relevant as an actor. Um, the, I guess the main difference for me is that like, with the music, I, 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 I write these songs, we, we play them, we play them for people, and it doesn't matter to me if people like them or not, because I'm really making them for myself, it's gotta be real. I wanna be real when I'm seeing, singing, you know, and it's like therapy for me, it really is. I mean, the lyrics are very personal, sometimes too personal, but like it really is, it's, it, it, it's an exalting feeling and it's, uh, it's something that I need to do for me personally. But, I, but I'm not caught up in if the records sell or not, if we make money or not, if people like it or not, it's just something that I need to keep doing. Whereas the acting is like, I, I care, <laughs> I care. I want people to think I'm doing a good job, I wanna keep getting hired, I wanna keep working on new and fun and, interesting shows and movies. Um, so I, I don't know if I answered your question so much as like, I, I guess I'm both, but at the end of the day, like I do consider myself an actor, first and foremost. I, I, I don't, I know musicians and singers that are unbelievable, and I just like, I just don't put myself on that same level. It's like, I think to me, like, you know, I'm awed by incredible musicians, you know. I, I strive to be that, but, uh, but um, anyway, so I guess I'm an actor, but I have a band that's pretty, pretty serious too. <laughs> I just answered that question like I answer when someone says, "Do you did you like this movie?" I'm like, I like that movie a lot. I, I like it was a great it was a great movie. It was it was you know it wasn't the, it wasn't the best, but it was okay. It was okay. I didn't love it, but I actually didn't like it very much at all. But it was it was great. <laughs> I always flop on movies when, when people, the person I'm talking to, I will adopt whatever they thought about the movie. I like most movies I see. I just do. I like the experience of going to a theater and seeing a movie. But then I'll talk to someone like, and I'm not sure if people liked it or not. I'm like, I like that movie. And somebody like, I hated it. I'm like, it wasn't great, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's weak. I'm weak. It's a weakness. Hi, Rob. Hi. So in Don't Call Me Shirley, Chuck looks at Metatron and he says, the last time I saw that look on an editor's face, I was turning in Bugs. Do you ah. believe Bugs to be the worst episode of the series? And if not, which one is? 
<laughs> That's so funny. I forgot about that line because I also mentioned bugs in like season four, my first episode, I mentioned bugs. Because I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry about bugs. <laughs> uh, and then we watched bugs uh, for our podcast. And like, I didn't think it was that bad. None of them it wasn't like my favorite episode, but I, I think Tyler's adorable. And, you know, he was, he's so great. And uh, I don't know, it was interesting. I mean, I don't love the idea of like, bugs, bugs gross me out. But um, it, it wasn't the best. I mean, it wasn't the, the worst. I, I really, <laughs> I hated it. No, no, no. I really, I really didn't dislike it. I didn't like that. I think it been, it been, it been told. I've been told it was so, so bad. And then when I finally watched it, I'm like, that wasn't so bad. Um, what, what was the, what, is, what was the other part of your question? If that one wasn't the worst, which was the worst episode of the series? Oh, uh, geez. Well, I haven't watched every episode yet. Right. I'm, I'm making my way through it. Rich and I do this podcast, right, called Supernatural Then and Now. Love Thank it. you. So we're watching it from scratch for the first time. We're really watching it like in order, and because I've only I've, I haven't seen every episode. I've seen a bunch, but like out of order, and and so it's really interesting. So I I really can't say because we're only in season three. Um, what is that? My so my phone just started playing a song. That's, what the hell? Siri thought I said something. That's so bizarre. Um, yeah. um, so, uh, so I can't, really can't say, but another sh episode that my character mentioned early is the ghost ship. Yeah. What is that? Was Bella? What season? Three. 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 So we're about to get to that. We haven't gotten to that yet. So I have a feeling that's maybe not great. But I don't know, just only because Chuck says it in season four, he's like, oh, the ghost ship. And these are obviously episodes that Kripke had negative thoughts about, and that's why he voiced it through my character, right? <laughs> Everything I said in season four and season five was straight from Kripke. Um, so, yeah, so I can't say, look, I could say this, I am impressed with how great the show is. Like, I always knew it was a great show, I always knew the writing was great. But we, we go back and we watch the show that started in 2005 and we're, I'm captivated by it. It's, it holds up, it looks great, the guys are great, all the guest stars are superb, and I'm really, I haven't been bored yet. You know, it's, it's, it's a great show. So I guess my answer is I don't think there's a bad one. You know, I think even, even the ones that don't interest you as much, they're still fun to watch, you know? And then the things that people have told me like, oh, season one is not, Great, it's Monster of the Week. Like, Monster of the Week was so fun. I thought that was yeah. really fun. And the boys are almost like superheroes battling a new bad guy every week. It was like reading, you know, Pulp Fiction or, you know, a comic book. Um, and then the show kind of takes a turn and then they start dealing with like demons and shit. And you're like, oh my God, this is, wow, this, this got, just got better. And I think it just keep, keeps getting better and better. So uh, I've been really impressed. So we're, we weren't wrong. It was a great show. It's the reason we're all here right now. So I'll let you know. I'll let you know. If there's a show that I really didn't like, I'll, I'll let you know. But for the most part, I'd give it a thumbs up. Thanks. Seems like maybe you're not satisfied with my answer, but that's just the truth. I really haven't seen one yet where I was like, Pfft. we'll see. I can say this much. The... Uh, we were, dis we were all disappointed that the finale couldn't be what we wanted the finale to be, what was originally going to be. And I say that selfishly because they were going to do this really cool thing, and I don't know how many of you know this, but at the, before COVID, the plan for the finale was that in heaven there was going to be this bar, and in the bar it was like all the people that would be in heaven that had been on the show, yeah. they were like the good guys that have been on the show, that are now in heaven, and they'd all be there. And then, and then they'd say the last line or whatever, and then the camera would turn to offset, and we'd break the fourth wall, and all the rest of us would be there. And then we were gonna start our after party, and they were gonna, as the credits roll, record us just toasting and being all together. We all had hotels booked, when I say all of us, like everyone you're seeing at the convention, and then some. 
all your favorite characters returning. And uh, I was just going to be like a great end to 15 seasons of working together, being together, and then COVID happens. But COVID happened literally the day before I was supposed to fly up to record, uh, to shoot the second to last episode. And then everything shut down for five months. And then when we went back to do the end, they, they just couldn't because Canada had these strict rules as they should because of COVID. So they couldn't do it. They couldn't fly everybody up. And uh, so then they had to completely change it. And it's a sweet shot now at the end on the bridge with the whole crew. I mean, okay. it was great. It just we never really got to as a cast and the crew, like, a lot of the actors never got to say goodbye to the crew, you know. So anyway, that we COVID did. really put a dent in that. And that's a regret that is beyond our power, but it would have been really cool. Hi. Hello. Uh, first, I would just wanted to say that this is super legendary just because of the first Supernatural convention ever in the show with Chuck's panel. This is just... Fantastic. It's crazy, right? Yeah, it's, it's so similar. It's insane. I know. I know. And the me being the little nervous guy. Yeah. Yeah. I'm but sure my I'm very, very first convention ever was right after that aired. <laughs> and in Chicago in like 2009 or something. And I was, and I was really, it was wild because I was exactly like that. Because Chuck's like shaking and he's got water bottle. And then I come out on stage in real life and I'm shaking. I've got the water bottle. And, I was like, wait, what's real? <laughs> but the, the question, I guess, is yes. um, in Swan Song, as Chuck is writing out the beautiful words, we all love it, um, did you, at that point, know what direction they were taking Chuck's character, like turning him into God? Um, at that point, I did. That's the first time I did. Um, you know, everyone who was working on the show kind of got it before I did, um, because, it, you know, I'm reading the script, which I got like a week before I'm going to go up there to shoot it, which is normal. And I see that at the end of it, I just, I just go away. I just poof. I'm like, what the hell? And, um, and then I get up to set and one of the crew members is like, so you're God, huh? And I was like, uh, is that okay? Is that what it, okay? Huh? Well, I didn't, I don't know. Okay, sure. And then um, Kripke calls me, Eric Kripke, you know, created the show, calls me and was like, so... How does it feel to be God? And I was like, okay, so that is what it is. Okay, that, wow, that's, that's pretty, pretty, pretty awesome. Not gonna lie, it's pretty great. He's like, so I just want you to know you're probably not gonna come back to the show. And I was like, oh, well, that's pretty awful. That's a horrible, that's a horrible thing. So he was like, I just don't, I can't have the character of God coming in saving the day. I just can't, you know. And I don't think he, he and then he left the show after season five. And that swan song was sort of his love letter to the show through me, and I was always sort of in a manifestation of him. Um, I, my, my interpretation of God at that point was that I'm God in the sense that Eric was the creator of the show. So that was you know, manifested through the writer. That's me. So then he leaves the show. Then the show keeps going. It's going great. And then, you know, five years later, five seasons later, they're like, let's bring Ron back. And, you know, and then I came did a cameo in season 10 and then came back season 11 for my fighting with my sister and all that. Um, so yeah, but season, end of season five, Swan Song, that's when I, that's when I just first knew. And I, I always want to ask Eric, and I keep forgetting whether or not he knew all along that that's what my character was. Like nobody told me until that moment. Until the, the boom guy or something was like, so, you got it. <laughs> no. And I was like, okay. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty wild. I always, I always say it's like that phone call from Eric was like the best news and the worst news all at once because you're not going to be back at the show. Stung at that point, but then, but then I was, so it all wound up all right. Hey, Rob. Hi. I'm Erin. Hi, Erin. Uh, three positive notes for you, then a question. Okay. SPN Then and Now, super awesome, love it. Thank you. Kings of Con podcast and TV show, super awesome, love it. Thank you. Thanks for the tip about Silver Lake Wine. They have really <laughs> great stuff. They do, right? So, Are you you from around? You live around there? I did. I just moved back to Orange County, but I lived near. Uh, I lived in Chinatown for like the last seven years. Fantastic. So yeah, I explored all the places you guys talked about. I love it. Neat. I know. We and we didn't make a dime. I know, right? Silver Lake Wine. They have no idea. Criminal. <laughs> so my question for you is the first thing I remember seeing you in was Waiting. Oh, yeah? And it was, the movie was a hoot and a half. Uh -huh, it was. So I was wondering, like, 
I, I assume it was fun to work on. Super. But like, do you have any like favorite interactions with any particular like characters from that that movie? Oh man, we had the, <laughs> the best time. I love it. It was a hoot. It was a hoot. And it was a hoot to work on. It really was. It was so much fun. We were in New Orleans for about a month and a half. We were living that life that we were doing on screen in terms of partying. A lot of that, because uh, we were all pretty young. And yeah, I mean, I, you know, um, all of us got, I mean, like Justin Long and Anna Ferris, uh, and Caitlin Doubleday and, and I hung out a lot. And then, um, and then Ryan Reynolds was, at the beginning, he was sort of like, he would just go home at night because he had this girlfriend at the time. He was going out with Alanis Morissette and like he would talk to her on the phone. And, so and then he was like, uh, he was come off another movie, so he was tired. But then he realized like, that we were pretty fun. So then he started coming out and that was great. And he was awesome. Um, and then he told me later in the shoot that uh, we were talking about who our set crushes were. You have set crushes like, ooh, I, kinda, I think that the girl who operates the camera, I think she's kind of cute, or whatever. People always talk about their set crushes. And Ryan Reynolds told me that I was his set crush. So. Yeah, was, it's up there with top moments. Uh, anyway, no, everybody's so cool. We just had a, such a laugh. And everyone was super funny, and yeah, it was great. And I still talk to Justin and to Anna. Um, but yeah, they're great. And I'm so happy that people still know that movie and talk about it. And every wait, every restaurant I go in, people, waiters are like, are you from waiting? Oh so, yeah, it's good to know. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for the positive feedback. Yeah. Have you guys ever seen the movie Waiting? Yeah. Oh. Okay. How many people have seen Still Waiting? The sequel. Okay, yeah, Still Waiting. Not as good, not as good of a movie, but it's fun if you want to see me make out with Jensen's wife. <laughs> Before they were married, and it was just for acting, just acting. But yeah, I got to kiss Daniil. On camera. And he's not seen it yet. I don't think he will. <laughs> I hope he doesn't. Hi. Hi. A um, couple things. Love you. So nervous being up here. Like, I Thanks. Say my daughter's braver than me. But um, uh, so. You are awesome as Chuck and God, obviously. And one thing I wanted to request, hopefully for later, that you can sing Fare Thee Well, because that was like my iconic moment. Oh, of, cool. Like, obsessed. I Googled it, tried to find it everywhere. Um, anyways, hopefully you can sing that at yeah. some point. But yeah. another question, I've watched you on Lucifer as well. I'm diehard Supernatural, but I did dabble in Lucifer. And I, yeah. it was crazy. When I saw you, I was like, oh my God, how was that for you? Obviously, I know you said you like playing the bad guy. You were super bad. And then, what did you think about that, like, difference between Supernatural and Lucifer? Um, it was wild, you know, what was wild about it was that um, I, was, I was another show where I was at the end of the show bringing down the show. Like, literally, nearly killed Lucifer, and it was the, you know, I was in the last couple of episodes of that show, of that show ever, and so, I was like, oh my god, I'm a show killer. Um, but, uh, it was super fun. I, I, um, it was a challenge, you know, playing a, going from Chuck to playing a, like a French mercenary. Um, but it was it was super fun, so fun. I knew we knew those. Richard and I met the Lucifer cast uh, at Comic Con years ago, and we rode a, a train together back from San Diego back to L.A. So we all really bonded, and uh, so I just knew that cast and who was really comfortable. Um, and you know, Tom Ellis is a good friend, and so that was fun to play with him. Um, so yeah, it was just, it was super fun and, you know, nothing will ever compare to Supernatural. The, the crew at Supernatural was just top notch and I, I knew them. I mean, so many of the crew members had been there from the beginning. So every time you went up to do it, even between season five and season 10, which I wasn't on it at all, it's, it's a lot of the same people. And so they're just such good old friends, you know, and there just will never be a show like this. It was a special, unique, lightning in a bottle thing that we, I fortunately got to be a part of. Um, that being said, Lucifer was so great, so fun. Everyone is super, super cool and nice. And, um, and I'm, again, very thankful I got to be a part of it. And um, yeah, I, I hope with this new format that maybe some of those guys can come hang out, do some of these conventions. Yeah.
Okay, I, I will, I will. I was gonna play it now, but my guitar is not up here. But yeah, thank you, I will. Um, yeah, Lucifer. Lucifer. Hi, I know you really can't talk specifics, but um, can you tell us anything about your time on The Boys? Well, uh, I, I can't say much. They shaved my hair, the head, and I've been working on it since September, so it's a lot. But um, it's, uh, when you see it, it's, it's gonna be, it's like, <laughs> I'm not like a huge part of the show or anything, but the like, there's an episode and it's, it's pretty wild. And I, I, I think you're gonna be, well, you'll be, you'll remember it. It's the boys. So I'll say that much. It's the boys and I'm definitely on the boys. And it's pretty wild. Um, it was like no other, it has been like no other job I've had and I can't wait to be able to talk about it. Uh, but uh, yeah, other than it's just, it's gonna be my mind blowing a bit. Literally? Uh, yeah, yeah. It's traumatic. It's traumatic, but in a good way. Um, and yeah, and it was fun to work with Eric again. I mean, he didn't direct it, but he was, we were talking and stuff. And, uh, so that was fun. And, uh, and Phil Segrisha is up there, you know, producer of Supernatural, producer director of Supernatural. Um, so it's fun to work with those guys. And that cast is really cool. Like, like actually cool, like, Cool as in like, I wish I was as cool as them. Because um, I did most of my stuff with the boys. And those guys are cool. Uh, you know, Carl, uh, Frenchie, it's amazing. So cool. So uh, anyway, hopefully we can get some of those guys to be on this, come to these conventions too, that'd be fun. But yeah, you'll, I, think you, I think you'll like it. If you like the boys, then you'll like it. And uh, yeah, and I think it'll be memorable. <laughs> Thanks. I wish I could say more. I've already said too much. How's it going, Rob? Good, man. How are you? From California. I just want to say loved you and waiting. Thanks, and, man. And also, you signed my banner I won last year, so thank you so much for awesome. that. Awesome. But, uh, so, I'm a musician myself, um, and in show business, a lot of stars either start out as musicians and then become actors, or vice versa. So, my question for you is, would you do it the same way if you could go back the way that you've done it now? Or would you start as a musician and then become an actor? No, I think that this is the way that it was meant to be. You know, I, I, it took me a while to develop as a songwriter. Um, I knew at a young age I really wanted to act. And I mean, I'm talking like 12, like that's really what I wanted to do. And, and, I, and I was never like the guy that would like had to be center of attention or anything. I just, I, I, I just, I just enjoyed the process. You know, I did a lot of like community theater at home and um, school plays, and I always, you know, wanted to be the lead role, and you know what I mean. Really had striped, big, and uh, so then like early in high school, I was like, I'm gonna go to theater school and college, and it was just like always my life plan. Uh, and music was like my mom bought me. A good, I always loved music. Our music was always on at our house. My mom bought me a guitar out of the J.C. Penney's catalog when I was like 12 and uh, and uh, I took a couple of lessons and then I just like learned from friends that were better than me um, and so I just you know longer to develop as I think a musician be comfortable singing um, and so yeah so I, I think it happened the way that it was supposed to um, I'm glad I went to school for acting I, I met so many great people and it's been a it's been a it's been a it's been a good road you know and it's I, like I said, I feel so lucky that that as an actor, I'm able to um, that people that know me my, uh, knew, know me as an actor enjoy my band, you know, or want to see my band. That's that's really cool, and it, it's all it, it feels like icing on the cake a little bit, you know. I guess that's what I meant when I said earlier that like I don't I don't put as much pressure on the music to have to be to make money or to be liked or whatever. I just I just don't think that way because I think it would spoil it for me if I put that pressure on it, you know. Um, so it's like it's icing on the cake. It's like it just feels so awesome when people are like, and I love your band. I'm like, ah, oh, thank you so much, you know. Um, so yeah, 
It reminds me of uh, one time I had an audition and uh, Jason Schwartzman was there and we were, had to walk down this long hallway to this audition. And it was, this is like 15 years ago, but he, so like he had just done Rushmore and I was like huge fan of that movie. And so, and I'd also seen his band. He was in a band, he played drums in a, in a band. And um, I was like, hey, I'm a big fan of your work as we're walking down. He's like, ah, oh, thanks man. And he kind of like retreats back to himself. I'm like, oh shit. And I was like, and I, also I saw your band uh, at the whiskey. He's like, oh, you did, how were we? Were we okay? And then he's like, super interested in it. Like he, that, that part of it, he really, he, he, he's like, oh my God, you saw the band. Um, I always think about that. I don't know why. Um, I don't know how it was relevant right now, but anyway, uh, yeah, I, I think the way I did it was the way it was supposed to be. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, man. Thank you. Yeah, life's interesting, you know, you go back and think, oh, should I have, but I don't think you should spend time, you know, going, should I have done this? What would have happened if I would have done this? It, it happened. This is how it happened. And here we are, still alive. And that's good. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> How you doing? Hi, good. All right, my question is, is there any plot point you wished they explored more in Supernatural for Chuck? Is there any aspect you were like, ah, oh, why didn't we go into detail? Um, yeah, I wish we would have gotten his backstory. I think it would have been great to have like a, an episode where you find out how Chuck became God. Like, at what point was Chuck the Vessel, did that Chuck the Vessel become God? Uh, I, I would love to know that backstory because I don't know. No one told me. I have to guess. Um, so that, and I think it would have been fun to have an actual scene with Lucifer. I, I got to have that scene with Misha as Lucifer, Castiel as Lucifer, which was awesome. I love that scene that we got to have together and got to explore some of those things. But it would have been, in addition to that, I would love to have a scene with Pellegrino. Because uh, we always do it up on stage when he's here, uh, but to play out that. Or to have a, an episode where like all my sons are there. I think that'd be cool. You know what I mean? Uh, like Thanksgiving Yeah, like, like a bad Thanksgiving dinner. Yeah, with Gabriel and Michael, Lucifer, um, and Sebastian Roche. That would, that would be super fun. That would have been cool. The other last thing I would say is like, Maybe not be such an asshole. Maybe at the end of the show, have some sort of redemption, something. But it needed to be this way. This is the way it needed to be. I was the bad guy, so you want to see me left in the dirt. But, man, it would have been cool if there had been like, ah, sorry, guys. Handshakes. I love ya. Anyway, that's my version. Yeah. Thanks. Hi. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, yeah, the, the, the end of the show was, it was rough on old Chuck, really rough. I mean, I deserved it. I mean, I made the dog die, made Becky go away, awful things, unforgivable. But it would have been, like, been nice if it had been like, ah, uh, I could have had like a Scrooge moment where I woke up the next morning and the ghost did it all in one night. And <laughs> it was really God again, good God, benevolent God. And everything was okay. But that's in my own story. That's not supernatural. That's in the God story. Oh, that'd be a good spin-off. I get visited by three ghosts. <laughs> yeah, Santini Castiel. <laughs> so I'm from Utah, and as I was on my way to meet with my carpool person, I saw a Loudon Swain bumper sticker when I stopped at the stoplight, and I was like, I'm going to go see him. It's going to be exciting. What? Yeah, so you're popular even in Utah. That's amazing. I know, I know. So my question for you is, so when um, Chuck the Prophet is doing his convention, and he goes and... Um, he, he hits the ghost with the, the poke, the, the, the thing, the fire poker thing, yeah. the iron, right? <laughs> yeah. So if Chuck didn't become God, stayed as the prophet, do you think he would have ever gone into hunting? And if so, what would have been the monster that you would like to defeat? Well, I mean, I think that, I mean, I think we got to see what, when, when Chuck was, before we knew Chuck was God, 
there was that episode, The End, where I'm like, we're at war, and I'm not really the prophet, but I'm there, and with them, and, and remember Castiel is like kind of a hippie? Do you remember the episode I'm talking about? So, it's the toilet paper one, yeah. So I was like radar from MASH. I'm like the guy that's keeping track, <laughs> keeping stats. I don't go out into battle. And I really loved that about Chuck, that version of Chuck especially, just like, no, you boys go and good luck out there, but I'm keeping track of toilet paper and, you know, marking things on a you know, notepad. Uh, to me, that was, that's him. Uh, he's not gonna go to battle. That being said, if I did go to battle, um, who, what monster would I want to defeat? <sighs> um, I'm trying to think of some of the monsters I've seen in the first few seasons. Um, um, I mean, who, who are the monsters with their face goes, Le -le -le -le. The Yeah, Leviathan. <laughs> They're creepy. <laughs> no, thanks. So maybe one of them would be good. And then, like, maybe I could defeat them. Um, like, I don't know, <laughs> like, uh, I don't know, like the, the bad guy from uh, Stranger Things, <laughs> that, that guy, who was like in the evil world, he was like, uh, I don't know, like <laughs> demon looking guy, uh, and the yellow-eyed monster, yeah, I, I think I'd probably want to kill him, he was, he's really good, but he needs to go away. How about this, how about I defeat evil Chuck, so good Chuck v. Evil Chuck. And then Good Chuck wins, and then we have the moment of I'm benevolent again and everybody likes me, and the world lives on, and Sam and Dean are alive and well, and everybody's dogs are alive, and Becky's back with her husband and her family. That's a world I want to live in. Chuck versus Evil Chuck. Fight! It's like a video game. L2, L2, X, circle. Finish him! Anyway, that's, uh, that's me doing Chuck versus Chuck. Thank you for your question. Do we have one more? Let's clear it. Hey, Rob. Uh, Anybody? Uh, just wanted to say I do love that song fairly well when you sang it. Um, very emotional. So <laughs> Thank you. I, when you did that performance, uh, that that was like a poop moment. You know, Thank like you. Climax moment. But, Thank you so uh, much. But I had I had a question about the equalizer gun that you created for uh, right to, to defeat uh, Jack, right? So, right. When you shoot it and it shoots you. Yeah. So yeah. Like, when you when you presented that, you said that it creates a wavelength balance between whoever you shoot, right? Yeah. So how what do you think? If, um, do you think there would have been any other consequences to being shot at? Like, so, it said Sam shot you, that equalizing moment, since you did, they, they took a turn where you, uh, they deteriorated God, right? Uh -huh. But, uh, the way I was looking at it was like, what if that wavelength connected Sam to God? Ooh. To a point where, you know, maybe he starts to inherit God's power. Oh! How would that... That would have been interesting. What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> I mean, that would have been interesting. An interesting way to... I mean, I think Sam's... Uh, throughout the whole series, Sam deals with sort of an otherworldly thing going on. And, you know... Um, so I think that would make a lot of sense. Um, Sam, of all people... I mean, where Rich and I are at in the show, like, Sam was like... The chosen one. I don't think they're gonna. Uh, the boys are gonna survive. I'll be honest. I, don't, I think season three may be it. Yeah, we were we worry that they're not gonna make it through because uh, everyone keeps almost dying. I mean, it's a bloodbath. I think that's a good idea. I think that would have been really cool if Sam had some powers, um, and then it would have been Sam versus Evil God. Fight. So um, anyway, yeah, that that. That's you you just, uh, in that scenario, you just punched Sam in the penis. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just basing on height, you yeah. know, like... <laughs> you, throw, you went right, right with the jewels. L1. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, thanks for your question. Thanks, everybody, for the panel. Ladies and gentlemen, well, you don't get to go anywhere because now we're going to... I'm going to...
sing you. I'm gonna. Okay, this is great. Let's do an outro, uh, and, you're and then you're gonna come back on. No, because we have a costume contest to introduce. Oh. Okay, so let's play around. Ladies and gentlemen, rock band. Yeah, Gangster, by the way, you know this. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, our next, uh, our next event is not for the meat, not for the faint of heart. You can enter, you may not exit. It's, it's one of those events where you may be like dressing up as your favorite characters. You Maybe you go to other conventions and do that, and it's all funny games here. So I'm gonna take it very seriously. You know what I mean when you hear the words. It's a costume contest. Now the executioner himself, Adam Malin! Ah.